Chapter 7, Kinetic Energy and Work. Box number 1. Work is energy put to some use. Energy transferred to an object is positive work. Energy transferred from an object is negative work. Work only happens when a force acts on a moving object. So you could push really hard against a wall, but if that wall doesn't move, you're not doing any work. Box number 2 is the formal definition of work. You've probably learned in the past that work is force times distance. This definition is saying the same thing, but it's saying work is the integral of the dot product between the applied force and the displacement. We'll spend a lot of time on the dot product, but right now you can start thinking of the dot product as the product of parallels. The dot product addresses the parallelness between two vectors. The cosine term captures this parallel component. You see the introduction of a brand new unit. If work is force times distance, force is newtons, distance is meters, so a newton meter is what we call a joule. If you know the polynomial expression for force, you can integrate it using calculus. Otherwise, you'll have to use other methods. Because work is defined as the product of force times the displacement through which that force acts, we use the dot product, the product of parallels. Study this visual summary really carefully. What's the dot product of vector A with vector B? I can take the component of vector A that lies along vector B and multiply them together. Or conversely, I could take the component of vector B that lies along vector A and multiply those together. The cosine function captures this parallel component. I'll give separate supplemental exercises focusing exclusively on dot product. It's that important. For starters though, study this visual overview and make sure it makes sense to you. Look at this example. If I apply a force to that red box at some angle, you can see that the y component of this force does no work whatsoever. You can also see the x component of this force does work because the x component of this force is parallel to the displacement. Let me make a point about the terms parallel and anti-parallel. Parallel in my usage means parallel and same direction. Anti-parallel means parallel and opposite direction. So in this case, the component fx is parallel to the displacement vector and thus does positive work on the red box. If f sub x were opposite, I would say f sub x is anti-parallel to the displacement vector and is thus doing negative work. So the dot product of vector a with vector b is the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the angle between them. That's referred to the magnitude angle form. The alternative and equivalent form form is the dot product form. If you're working with unit vectors, there's another approach to expressing the dot product. We'll spend a whole separate segment on calculating the dot product using unit vectors. So there are three ways to calculate the product of parallels with two given vectors. The dot product method, the magnitude angle method, and the unit vector method. You need to be proficient with all three. Right now you're using these methods in conjunction with work analysis. There are many additional situations where you again need to figure out the product of parallels. Okay, let's deal with a special case, but it's pretty common and we can generalize it as well. It's time to derive the work done by a constant force. Imagine a bead on a wire and you apply a force in the direction shown in this visual. As mentioned before, the Y component of your applied force does no work whatsoever. If the object doesn't move in the direction of the force, no work occurs. On the other hand, the the horizontal component does do work because it is moving the object in the same direction as the applied force itself. Box 1, we're starting with the basic definition of work and we're using a subscript x because we'll limit ourselves to the x dimension only and again we'll generalize it later. Box 2 is the copy and paste of box 1 except we're using the magnitude angle version of the dot product. Box 3, in this special case, the applied force is constant and the angle between the force and the object object's displacement is constant as well, so we bring them to the left side of the integrand. The integral of dx is x, we evaluate it, and that's how we end up with box 4. Box 5 shows you what you may have already learned in your past. Work is force times distance, but we're being a lot more analytical and careful. In box 6, we're generalizing to use the 
dimensional vector r. This r displacement vector has three components, an x, y, and z component, or i, j, and k components. So it's general in the sense that this object can move in three dimensions, but again, the assumption here is the applied force is constant. Here in box six, you have the three different expressions that all mean the same thing, the magnitude angle version, the dot product version, and the unit vector or component version. Next section, kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is motion energy. Let's define it as kinetic energy K equals one half mv squared. So your automobile traveling at 60 miles per hour has a lot more kinetic energy than it does if it's traveling at 15 miles per hour. On the other hand, if you could ride a bicycle at a great enough speed, your bicycle could have a greater kinetic energy than a very large automobile moving at 60 miles per hour. Standard procedure, let's do dimensional analysis. If kinetic energy is one half mv squared and we plug in units for each of those variables, you get what you see here in box two. Kinetic energy is expressed in joules just like work and that's pretty meaningful. Now we turn to the work kinetic energy theorem. This is a very foundational relationship. There's an entire lab dedicated to this. There's lots of homework problems in this category. Again, this is a cornerstone. I'm going to reuse this visual as the basis for this derivation. I walk up to this box. I apply some force to this box at a given angle theta. The box moves through some displacement x. In box number one, I start with the basic definition of work. I switch from dot product representation to magnitude angle representation. Box two, theta is zero. And remember what theta is. Theta is the angle between the applied force vector and the object's displacement vector. Here's the visual again. Theta is the angle between the applied force vector and the object's displacement vector. Box three, cosine of zero is one. Box four, here's an interesting move. I'm using Newton's second law to replace the variable f with mass times acceleration. Box five, I remember the calculus definition for instantaneous acceleration. Box six, I remember the calculus definition for instantaneous velocity. I do a little rearranging and I get to box seven, which looks really busy. So give yourself a lot of time to really study it and review it and ask any questions if there's anything that doesn't make sense. Box eight is recapping box seven. The resultant yellow highlighted formula here is the work kinetic energy theorem. The net work acting on an object equals that object's change in kinetic energy. So if a force does work on an object, the kinetic energy of that object changes. Positive work increases that object's kinetic energy, and because we know kinetic energy is one half mv squared, positive work increases that object's velocity. Negative work decreases the object's kinetic energy, and for the same reason, negative work decreases the object's velocity. Boxes one through five just recap some forces that we've already studied. All forces fall under the umbrella of Newton's first, second, and third laws. Similarly, all forces do work on an object if that object moves. So by now, hopefully you're familiar with box number one, the gravitational force, box number two, tension, box three, the normal force, box four, kinetic friction, and box five, static friction. In box six, we introduce the spring force. Springs are important, but it turns out that a great many things behave as if they were springs. A spring behaves like a spring. Air behaves like a spring. A tabletop behaves like a spring. Just think of a basketball bouncing off the surface of a tabletop. And there are many more examples. The spring force is a restorative force, meaning springs always want to go home. They always want to return to a state of equilibrium where they are neither elongated nor compressed. So here's a spring mass system. If I attach this mass mass to that spring and I pull that mass to the right as you see in this figure, the spring exerts a leftward force on this mass. Again, springs always want to go home. In this case, I'm doing positive work on that mass, but the spring is doing negative work. That's kind of tricky, so make sure you look at that. In this bullet, I'm pushing the mass to the left, thereby compressing the spring. In this case, again, I'm doing positive work, but the spring is
is doing negative work. Here are some useful bullets. Consider the spring's equilibrium position as the origin when you problem solve. Springs are restorative. That's what that negative sign means in Hooke's Law. Springs always want to go home to a state of no compression or elongation. A spring does positive work on its mass while moving towards home. A spring does negative work on its mass while traveling away from home. So let's get analytical. Box 1. Remember the basic definition of work. Let's once again use the magnitude angle representation of the dot product. Box 2. I'm substituting variable f with the expression for the spring force. Again, that's known as Hooke's Law. And here you see in box 2 the expression for the work done by a spring, which can be positive or negative. Box 3 is reminding us that if we plot force versus displacement, the area under that curve is the integral of, in this case, f dx, which we have shown to equal 1 half kx squared in the case of a spring. Work done by a variable force. We know from calculus that the area under a force versus displacement graph equals the integral of f dx in this case. So if we have a variable force as opposed to a constant force that we looked at previously, we integrate. If you know the force function, you can use integral calculus to calculate the work that force does on an object. If you don't know the force function, which is pretty common in practice, then you use the computer to do computational integration. Last section, power. Power seems to be confused with work and energy pretty frequently. Power equals the rate of performing work or producing energy or consuming energy. If I drive my car from zero to 60 miles per hour in 10 seconds and compare that to driving that same car from zero to 60 miles per hour in five seconds, I see that in both cases, the net work is the same, but the power produced by my engine in taking my car from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 5 seconds is much greater compared to when it took my car from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 10 seconds. So let's start with box 2. Average power is again the rate of doing work or the rate of producing energy or consuming energy. Box 3, look what we're doing with calculus. We write dw dt instead of w over delta t. We remember the definition of work and we have another expression for power. So boxes 2 and 3 are basically your power toolkit that you apply depending on your specific situation. Box number 4, we do the dimensional analysis and we introduce a brand new unit, the watt. One watt is equal to one joule per second.